Many different shark species migrate to different parts of the ocean at different times of the year. Not all shark species are migratory, but there's a good few that are. Lemon sharks migrate from Florida to the Bahamas to give birth, and whale sharks head to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico to feed in the nutrient-rich waters that are there. It's not just Mexico, by the way. They do this in lots of different places around the world. Migrations are often thought of as being horizontal, from point A to point B but sharks also migrate vertically in the water column. Basking sharks and mega mouth sharks perform vertical migrations, i.e. up and down in the water column during different seasons in the year, moving to shallower depths during the day and diving down deeper at night. That type of migration is known as reverse dial vertical migration, by the way, and we're not entirely sure why they do it. Some have said it's related to their food source, which is plankton, and others have suggested it might actually be to help them reorientate themselves for navigation. Cookie cutter sharks also migrate up and down the water column, although they do the opposite to what basking sharks and mega mouths do. These little nightmare fish migrate up to the surface at night to take perfect circular chunks out of their much larger prey. If that wasn't a scary enough thought though, on rare occasions, that larger prey that I speak of might be a human. That is terrifying. So sharks are spending a lot of time going up and down, left and right. Migration is clearly a very important feature of their lives for lots of different shark species. Sometimes though, those migrations break all known records for their speed and overall distance traveled. None more so than Nicole the Great White Shark. This young female white shark broke every known scientific record we had about migration by a considerable margin. She traveled from South Africa to Australia and back again faster than any other known marine animal, and scientists could never really figure out exactly why she did it. This great white shark migration not only broke all the records, but the story surrounding it would change the course of history for great whites as a species forever. This is the story of Nicole the shark who traveled 12,000 miles for no apparent reason. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. Not gonna lie this morning, guys, I feel a little bit rough. Last night, we went to a meadery here in Cornwall. Have any of you guys been to a meadery before? If you have, do you like mead? Because I don't. I think it's absolutely horrible and I feel horrendous. So yeah, my head is hurting quite a lot this morning. <laughs> I actually think I might need a coffee. Hold on, I'm gonna pause this and go and get a coffee. There we go. That's better. Oh, that is gonna, that is gonna perk me up. That's gonna perk me up nice and good. I think considering I'm feeling quite rough today, all self-inflicted of course, we're probably not gonna be doing too many pieces to camera and it's gonna be mostly voiceovers. We'll see, this coffee might perk me up. Anyway, the story of Nicole the Great White Shark is an unbelievable story. It's filled with twists and turns, scientific discovery, and that slight mystery of not really knowing why she did it. I imagine if you like sharks, you've probably heard of Nicole the Great White Shark before. I'd say alongside the shark from Jaws and Deep Blue, she's probably one of the most famous sharks ever. But to truly understand her incredible story, we're gonna have to go back about 20 years to the year 2004. Raymond Bonfil and his team of researchers at the Wildlife Conservation Society were asking the right questions about great white sharks. Raymond is one of the big hitters in shark science and has been for the last 35 years. If you haven't heard of him before, he's well worth checking out. This guy has been responsible for some of the most groundbreaking scientific research on sharks, especially great whites. So Ramon and his team had started a long-term white shark tracking project a couple of years before in the hopes of trying to answer some of the most basic questions we had at the time about great white sharks. Namely, where do they live? At what times of year do they migrate? Where do they go? And which ones decide to go? In the years before this tracking project, it had been suggested in the literature that at least some some male great whites migrate between South Africa and Australia. They did this by comparing the genetics of the males in South Africa and the males in Australia and found a genetic link between those two populations. But at that point in time, it was speculated that only males perform this migration and not females. Despite the genetic evidence for male migration, a continent to continent swim like that had never been scientifically documented before. So on the 7th of November, 2003, Bonfil and his colleagues tagged a female great white shark measuring around 3.8 meters. She was tagged with a Pat Sat tag. Wow, that is fun to say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I've only ever read that in my head in research papers. Pat Sat tag. Anyway, this type of tag is otherwise known as a pop-up archival transmitter satellite tag. Damn. 
I prefer Pat Satzag. They didn't really expect much from her and had tagged a bunch of other white sharks before with interesting data, but nothing out of the ordinary for white sharks in this part of South Africa. So her track started just off the coast of Dyer Island in Gansby, South Africa. You'll have heard me mention Gansby before in previous Shark Bites episodes. It's a bit of a white shark hotspot. And like many sharks that are tagged with tracking devices, she was given a name. Nicole. According to those who were present during the tagging study, she was given the name Nicole because one of Bonfil's favourite actresses at the time was Nicole Kidman, who apparently, according to some interviews that she's done, absolutely loves to dive with sharks, but is deathly afraid of butterflies. Interesting thought process there, Nicole. <laughs> anyway, prior to being tagged by Bonfil in 2003, Nicole the Great White Shark had been being spotted every single year in Gansby since 1999. She was regularly identified by her dorsal fin markings as part of an ongoing photo ID project Project led by Michael Skoll of the White Shark Trust. Michael felt a pretty strong connection to Nicole, although she wasn't called Nicole at this point, she was only known as P12. But the reason he felt a strong connection with the shark was because she was the shark that kept on coming back. Michael had hundreds and hundreds of photos of Nicole's dorsal fin on his database as she consistently popped up in Gansby over the space of four years. Interestingly though, she was only ever seen in the area between the months of June and December, the rest of the year, she was somewhere else. And that could suggest that this migration could be a more regular occurrence than we think. So she was tagged and off she went out into the Indian Ocean. Because the type of tag she was fitted with was an archival tag, it meant the scientists couldn't track her movements in real time, unlike many of the tags that we have on white sharks today. So they simply had to sit and wait. These Patsat tags, though, are built with programming that allows them to detach from the shark at a predetermined date. And this allows the scientists to be able to collect the data because there's no way you finding that tag in the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean, at least not in 2004 anyway. But much to the relief of Bonfil and his team, the tag popped off on its scheduled date of the 28th of February 2004. Upon floating to the surface, the tag uploaded its data to a satellite, which then automatically relayed that data to the scientists' email accounts. Ramon Bonfil sat waiting eagerly at his computer in New York, and when he opened up the website with the tracking data, he couldn't believe his eyes. After spending a few days mooching around Gansby in South Africa, Africa, Nicole headed south and it looked like she might be heading into the southern Atlantic before she turned and headed east. And she just kept on swimming. That day, for no particular reason, I decided to go for a little run. Nicole had traveled all the way to Australia with her tag finally popping off not too far from Exmouth in Northwest Australia. That's a distance of about 6,900 miles or 11,000 kilometers all done in the space of about 99 days. What an achievement. That distance in that time had broken all known records for any marine animal. She had completed a transoceanic migration in just over three months. And she was the first white shark ever to do this, according to science. Obviously I say according to science there because white sharks have likely been doing this for a very long time. We just hadn't proved it yet. Since then as well, at least to my knowledge anyway, we haven't had a white shark who's been tagged who's done it again. So Nicole sits atop her podium alone. That distance traveled wasn't the only interesting piece of data that the scientists got back as well. It was also revealed she reached a max depth of 980 meters on one of her dives. And she even experienced temperature lows of 3.4 degrees Celsius, which is incredibly low for a great white shark. Before anyone comes at me with the whole temperature tolerable range of white sharks, she only spent a really brief amount of time at this temperature. We're talking a matter of minutes. So no, you're not gonna find great white sharks living in places where the temperature is consistently lower than 12 degrees Celsius. She'd also been spending most of her time at the surface during her oceanic swim at around 0 to 
0.5 meters, while occasionally diving deeper to around 500 to 750 meters. Spending the majority of time at the surface while doing an oceanic migration hadn't previously been reported for white sharks, which is a pretty strange finding. But Bonfil and his team speculated that she might have been using visual stimuli such as celestial cues to navigate. Yeah, that's right. Nicole the Great White Shark might have been using the sun, the moon, and the stars to help her navigate to Australia. That might sound a bit mad, but it's actually been proven that lots of different animals use the night sky to help them navigate. Seals, frogs, and songbirds are a few that spring to mind. So Nicole might have been using those celestial cues instead of, or as well as, the geomagnetic fields of the Earth. At the surface, she's looking up, and then at those deeper depths, she might be using the geomagnetic fields because they're stronger down there. I just find that absolutely amazing. I can't quite believe a shark could use the sky and then geomagnetic fields at the same time to help it navigate around the ocean. Now, I know at this point, some of you might be thinking the title of the video said she traveled 12,000 miles and so far she's only done half of that. Well, I think you can probably guess where this story is about to go. Because Nicole's tag had popped off, she was no longer being tracked via the use of satellite tags. But that's not the only way you can track a shark's movement. Remember earlier, I mentioned to you about the photo ID project being run by the White Shark Trust in South Africa? Photo ID is another great way to look at the movements of shark species. Okay, you don't get an exact route like you would with satellite tags, but because of the nicks and cuts, a white shark's dorsal fin almost acts like a fingerprint. And if you get a picture of her in one place, and then another picture of her in a different place, you can easily get that point A to point B. And that's exactly what happened with Nicole. Six months after her tag had popped off in Australia, Bonfil got a call from Michael Skoll of the White Shark Trust. Michael and his team had been out taking some more fin photo ID shots of great whites in Gansby. And sure enough, after looking through his pictures from the day, Nicole had returned. Sometime between February and August 2004, Nicole had decided she'd had enough of Australia and headed back to South Africa, making a round trip of 12,000 miles, over 20,000 kilometers in around nine months. What an absolute trooper. The findings from this research opened up so many different questions about white shark behavior and basically rewrote the book on what we knew about white shark migration. But why did she travel all that way? It's a bloody long way to go. So she's got to be doing it for a very important reason. Well, the scientists who were studying Nicole at the time weren't quite sure. It opened up a lot of debate in the scientific community, especially with great white shark scientists all around the world. And still to this day, we don't have an exact answer. The first one that might spring to mind would be mating. Reproduction is obviously a vital part of life for any animal, and great white sharks invest quite a lot of energy and time into their reproduction. They're what's known as a K-selected species, so they mature late, they live long lives, and they give birth to a few well-developed offspring. Traveling thousands of miles to find a mate perhaps isn't out of the question for a great white shark, but there is a footnote here that does cast a bit of doubt as to whether she was actually mating at all. Based on Nicole's size, she was deemed to not yet be sexually mature, and if she wasn't yet sexually mature, she wouldn't have swum all that way to go and find a mate. Nicole measured in at 3.8 meters long, 12.4 feet. And at that length, that's a bit shorter than the known sexually mature lengths for white sharks, which are around 4.5 meters or 14.8 feet. Because she was deemed to not yet be sexually mature, some other scientists in the community suggested that it might have something to do with feeding. Perhaps she was heading over to Australia at that time of the year to feed on some tasty Australian fur seals. But it would be a long way to go to just eat some seals, especially considering South Africa has a ready supply of seals and sea lions. South Africa also has way whales that winter in their waters as well, and a lot of different fish species. So there would have been plenty for Nicole to eat in South Africa. Why would she travel all those thousands of miles to eat something that she could have just eaten at home? It really puzzled the scientists and they couldn't find any proof either way, but they did come up with a third hypothesis. Perhaps Nicole was practicing her route to Australia in preparation for when she was sexually mature. She might have actually been doing a dummy run to make sure she knew which way to go when she got a bit bigger and decided it was time to make the scientists weren't exactly sure and they didn't have any proof, but I'd say that's a half decent explanation. There is also the possibility as well that she was doing it for no other reason other than the fact that she wanted to go for a swim. Scientists haven't been able to prove this transoceanic practice run hypothesis for the last 20 years, so we're still a little bit in the dark. But the story doesn't quite end there. Nicole's swim was truly remarkable, and of course, as you might expect, it gained a lot of attention around the world. It had been proved that white sharks weren't just these isolated populations in different parts of the world. At 
least some of them anyway, are physically connected to each other. And Nicole had proved that. The story was shared widely and it was presented at COP13 in Thailand. COP stands for Conference of the Parties and it's where all UN members come together in one place and vote on different protections for wildlife. After several failed attempts in previous years, Nicole's story, alongside some other important white shark population research papers, it was decided at COP13 that great white sharks would finally be placed on the CITES Appendix 2 list. This is a very high level of international protection for a wildlife wildlife species. It's not the highest, but it does give them a decent cushion. Nicole had changed the course of history for great white sharks forever. Sadly though, Nicole the white shark was never seen again after she was photographed in South Africa in 2004. It's impossible to know exactly what has happened to her, but considering the sad state of affairs for sharks, there's a decent chance she might have been fished and killed. But with her fin photo ID still on record, there's always a chance she might crop up in one of the many white shark photo ID projects in South Africa and Australia. Australia. A little older, a little wiser perhaps, there's always a chance that might happen. The ocean is a massive place. Regardless of whether she does or doesn't crop up again, she will go down in legend as one of the most important great white sharks in history, paving the way for scientific advancement and conservation of this impressive marine species. Maybe she swam all that way to get great white sharks international protection. Who knows? So there we go, guys. That's the story of Nicole the great white shark. Have you ever heard of her before? Do you reckon she still might be kicking around in the oceans? I want to hear all your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please, please do give it a like and don't forget to hit that subscribe button below. But before you head off, if you did enjoy today's video, then you might quite enjoy this one right here. You'll remember I spoke about how Nicole might have been using the moon to help her navigate across the ocean. Well, in this video right here, I take a look at how the moon affects lots of different shark species. In my opinion, I think it's quite interesting. So check it out here.